Good afternoon and welcome to the November 15th board meeting for the trustees of Johnson County Community College. We will hereby call the meeting to order. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Call in recognition of visitors, Ms. Schleist. This evening's visitors include Jessica Dane, Brent Yeager, Dick Carter, and Roberta Eveslage. Thank you. Awards and recognitions, uh, Dr. Sopcic. First on the agenda, uh, Dr. Cook, is uh, we'd like to recognize our partners at the Olathe School District. Um, you know, we work with six school districts in Johnson County, and uh, we're going to honor all six of them over the upcoming board meetings. Of all of them, Olathe is among the finest. Uh, we've always benefited from their incredible students. Their faculty and staff are terrific to work with. Um, they are true partners uh, in education here in Johnson County. A little bit about the district. Olathe has 30,055 students. That was last fall. In 2000, they had 20,872. They speak 88 different languages in their school district, 88. Their ACT composite average was 23.8. Seven students scored a perfect 36. They offer 40 College Now courses. We are very thankful for that. They have 35 elementary schools, 10 middle schools, and five high schools. Their 21st century high school academies feature aerospace and engineering, biotechnology, the culinary arts, e-communications, and much more. They have 17 Blue Ribbon School Awards. Obviously, this doesn't happen with great leadership. I will tell you, and that leadership is extremely collaborative with us. Superintendent John Allison was recognized as the 2018 Kansas Superintendent of the Year. Tonight, we have with us Assistant Superintendents, Dr. Jessica Dane and Dr. Brent Yeager. Please welcome, take the podium. Good evening, and thank you very much for the recognition of our very important partnership. Um, it's fun to sit and listen to you talk about our school district and, and the many accomplishments and things we have. Uh, we certainly know that wouldn't happen without incredible partnerships like the one we have with Johnson County Community College, so we want to thank you for that. Also, I want to send greetings from our superintendent, Mr. Allison, who you mentioned was the uh, 2017 Kansas Superintendent, I'm sorry, 2018 Kansas Superintendent of the Year, and he's actually in Washington, D.C. right now, completing his, his tour, if you will, of uh, events as part of that recognition, so that's why he's not with us tonight. Dr. Dane's going to talk a little bit more about some of our partnerships and, and share some thoughts there. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for recognizing us this evening. We are thrilled to be here, and as we thought about the words um, that we wanted to say, we also wanted to say how much we appreciate our partnership with you. Britt and I sat down and wrote down, a, you know, several of the things that we that we really appreciate about your partnerships. So, if you'll indulge me, I just wanted to share them. We're thankful for the articulation agreements for the CTE pathways, in, with pathway students, including both dual enrollment, the College Now course credits. And so, Denise, we thank you, your partnership in working with us, and Sheila, thank you so much for that. The continued expansion of College Now opportunities and courses. When we've said, hey, what do you think about welding? You said, sure. When we said, hey, what do you think about aviation? You said, let's do it. And so we appreciate you being open-minded and just continuing to give us those opportunities. Um, again, there's also advanced standing credit, student engagement opportunities, and events. Um, examples of those would be the healthcare challenge, um, opportunities in accounting, culinary competitions, and many more. Um, you provide professional development with us in collaboration with our teachers, assistance with community and career connections for students. Um, a big one is that you host the eighth grade expo here for us free of charge, and we have hundreds and hundreds of middle school students that get to come through and really learn about you and learn about other community partners, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, several of you have also spoken at different events that we've housed, and so we appreciate your expertise. 
Um, many of you um, on, on this board or in the, in the college um, participate in our 21st Century Academy Advisory Boards, and so we appreciate that advice and, and guidance that you give us. And then many of you sit on our comprehensive CTE Pathway Board. So I'm sure there are other activities that we've left out, but those are um, some of the major important ones. We just really appreciate this partnership and are thrilled to be here tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. In, in behalf of the college and our Board of Trustees, we'd like to present you with this with this timepiece, and um, uh, it's not just a regular clock because I think it represents all of the time that uh, you and your staff put in with our staff and the partnership. Uh, we we kind of believe that our mission is to uh, inspire learning, to transform lives, to improve communities, and the partnerships that you have joined in with us takes a lot of time. It's all about teaching and learning and helping people become what they were meant to become. So thank you very much, thank you. and. Uh, we appreciate everything you do. The uh, next uh, piece of recognition, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Weber. Yeah, um, I'd like to, uh, for this recognition, invite uh, Ms. Kenna Zumalt to come up to the podium, please. So as you're all aware, we've been celebrating our veterans for the past week. In addition to the wonderful ways we've been able to recognize, thank, and celebrate veterans attending JCCC, we have another very worthwhile recognition. It's my honor to recognize Ms. Kenna Zumo. Kenna is JCCC's Veteran Services Coordinator. Yesterday evening, Kenna received a well-deserved award from St. Michael's Veterans Center in Kansas City, Missouri. The celebration, which was held at the World War I Museum, recognize the extraordinary contributions of our community heroes who have created life-changing impact for veterans and share the St. Michael's core value of building a mutually supportive community committed to the well-being of veterans. St. Michael's recognizes businesses, community organizations, and individuals for their outstanding contributions. Kenna was the sole recipient of the Individual Guardian Award for her work with Student Affairs here at JCCC. I have to say, though, in addition to this award we're recognizing Kenna for this evening, there's something else equally worth mentioning. Each opportunity I get to connect with Kenna and the students she supports, I cannot help but notice the respect and admiration each one of them show for her. It's authentic and it's deserved. So Kenna, on behalf of the college, congratulations for your acknowledgement and thanks for your continued amazing support of our veterans and students. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Dr. Weber, um, and uh, thank you all for inviting me here this evening. That's very, very kind. Um, I do want to say thank you to the administration um, and to our student services leadership um, because that's what's made what we do in the Veterans Center possible is your support. Um, I'm really humbled and honored, though, to be able to walk alongside the student veterans um, over the last 12, 13 years, and it's just been fabulous um, opportunity to you know, give back to people who want to um, uh, pay it forward for each other as well. Um, we're really lucky. We have a fabulous uh, student leader with us tonight, uh, Donnie Witten, which I'm sure you all are very familiar with him. He works in our office and has been very active on campus as a student. And um, we were uh, uh, interviewed by KCPT as a part of their coming home uh, series, and so this, um, I'd like to share a little clip with you on that. Um, it's, I think the next broadcast time is December 10th, but we will be able to have the link um, on the 19th of November, so Chris, I know you'd be happy to have that. Um, so anyway, we got special permission to show you that this evening, and I don't see a mouse here. typically show, but we just thought this week during Veterans Week, it was so appropriate to, to do that. And then I think you noticed in there, over 432 veteran students here at JCCC alone served through the program. So, Kenna, you took off without receiving your award. You got to come back up. But thanks for, to you and your team for all the hard work you guys do for our students. Donnie, would you stand up, please? Yeah. Donnie Witten. Yeah. So, um, 
Before this board meeting, Dr. Sopcich and I had the opportunity to be interviewed by two of our uh, faculty members that are in a leadership class with KACCT, Kansas Association of Community College Trustees. And the question, one of the questions that was asked of me, what's most rewarding for being a trustee? And you just saw it. You just saw it on the screen. And so the success stories we have every day, and I'm sure that each trustee sitting here would say too that whenever we hear a success story of a person becoming something different than they thought they could be as a result of their engagement with our faculty and staff and this campus is, is really rewarding. Uh, one other illustration that uh, is, was so impressive to me was, uh, and I think, I think they were in the video, about two months ago, Dr. Sopcich and I had a chance to bring a friend of the college and a friend of ours to the campus. Uh, he happens to be 93 years old, and he's a World War II veteran. And when we took him up to the Veterans Center, and uh, we introduced him to, I think there were, it was around lunchtime, and I believe there were two people there. There was a young lady who I believe was an ex-Marine. I'm sorry, you're never an ex-Marine or an ex-Navy or an ex anything. She had been in the Marine Corps, and I believe the young man had been in the Navy. And when they found out that he was a World War II veteran, he had thanked them for their service, but they kind of clicked the heels and came to attention and said, thank you for your service, sir. And so I think for all of us to understand, um, and only those of you that have been through the military understand what it takes to um, take on a new life after that experience. And Donnie, you and Kenna, you guys do it so, so very well. So on behalf of the college and the trustees, sorry I missed it last night. I, had a I'm hospital deal. She's hospital. fine. That's good. But uh, yeah. thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Our next um, recognition for this evening, uh, Dr. Sheila Maupin, can you please come up to the podium? Sheila has been selected to receive the 2018 Kansas Council for Workforce Education Leadership Inside the Field Award. This award is designed to recognize individuals who have developed model programs, provided leadership, conducted research, or been involved in any other activity that advances the status and visibility of career and technical education within Kansas or beyond. Dr. Maupin has demonstrated excellence in leadership in the following ways instrumental in promoting career technical education. Innovation and creativity has sparked growth in technology internships across the state. She offers invaluable expertise to her colleagues across the state that is applicable to institutions of any size. Continually, she looks for opportunities to develop and grow new innovative programs and practices in career and technical education. I can attest to the fact that when we are up in Topeka, and we're dealing with the uh, Tech Authority or the Board of Regents, you are highly regarded, very much respected, and they're always effusive in their praise of what you do up there. So thank you, especially for what you do here. Thank you, Sheila. I have a voice, please. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's always effective. I have laryngitis, and so, uh, <laughs> but Sheila, on behalf of the college and the Board of Trustees, congratulations on your award. Uh, as we all know, we're in a little extensive uh, building project for career and tech education, uh, and, and the buildings are a part of it, but it's what you guys do every day uh, with people, working with people, and helping uh, a person uh, find a career and a job is really critical, so thank you very much. We appreciate all you do. Does that conclude your report? Wraps it up, Dr. Cook. Hey, thank you. That was fun. Um, the next item on the agenda is the open forum. The open forum is a time whereby um, um, the board listens to anybody from the audience that, uh, that has an item of interest. Uh, speakers must register and register for this uh, open forum prior to the board meeting, giving name and <coughs> address and so on and so forth. Each speaker is allotted five minutes. Uh, being that we have no speakers registered for this evening, I will not read all of the rest of the information, and I hereby call the open forum closed. Thank you. Student Senate report, Mr. Keltner. Thank you for being here, by the way. Thank you for having me. Um, I have an entire script ready, but I'll go into that in just a moment. As I was sitting over there talking to a few other of the senators, I realized I owe an apology to one of my professors from last year. 
I was in public speaking my first semester here, and towards the end of the semester, she asked what we thought of the class, and I told her I enjoyed it, but I didn't think I would ever actually use it. So, <laughs> hi, Ryan, I apologize. Uh, as you can probably tell, Tiger's not here tonight. He's out of state, I believe, at Grand Canyon University on a campus tour today and tomorrow. So, I'm here. I'm the vice president of the Student Senate and also presentation fill-in. I have my trusty sheet of paper for me to reference. Um, I'm currently in my second year here at Johnson County. Um, like many other students here, I wasn't sure if college was for me. I considered going to a four-year, but I thought this would be better for me. I really do enjoy it now, and I plan on transferring to K-State next fall for the 2019 semester. I'm gonna pursue a degree in either management of information systems or economics. I've considered graduate school, but I'll worry about that if I finish. Uh, not quite the PowerPoint type. As I've already said, I got my sheet of paper. I'm just gonna hit the main points, so this is probably gonna be the quickest presentation of the night. Tiger can fill in the other details. Uh, so I'll get started with the details. Uh, the current budget, we currently have $23,850 of our 38,000 allocated for the year. It's looking like we'll end up at around the 20,000 mark by semester end, which is pretty good and on par with average for the past years. Um, since last meeting, uh, in October, we've allocated around $2,500 to three clubs. If I'm not mistaken, that should grow to about five or $6,000 on Monday to another club. On October 26th, we had the trick-or-treat event for kids we mentioned last time. There was around 150 kids that came and over 10 clubs or organizations on campus participated. Uh, I was partially in charge of that, so I take partial credit. The other person was Sam Cheney, so I thank him for his assistance in that. Uh -oh. Right now, we're working on the JCC Gives. As Tiger mentioned last time, we are still accepting monetary donations by either check made out to the campus, JCCC, and with JCC Gives in the memo. Or you can hand me cash, or you can take it to the Center for Student Involvement in... He's passing the hat. <laughs> huh? He's gonna pass the hat. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm going too fast. Uh, the Center for Student Involvement, I wrote down the name somewhere. Student Center 334, that is the old <laughs> testing center. It had to move due to the construction on campus. Right now we have around 35 students or faculty nominated to receive some form of aid. I think that might have grown to 37 today, but I haven't looked, so I'm not sure. Uh, last, but certainly <coughs> not least, we have gained three new senators. They weren't able to make it tonight, but I would still read off their name and their fun fact, as Tiger likes to do. Uh, the first one is Dalal Essa. She has traveled to eight countries and six U.S. states. She is also fluent in Arabic. Next, we have Joshua J. Joswara. I hope I said that right. He used to be a junior wheelchair, wheelchair tennis athlete in junior high when he was younger. And Julie Bramer, her favorite hobby is graphic design, and I believe that's what she's also majoring in. To wrap this up, I would just like to invite all of you or any one of you to stop by one of our general assemblies sometime. Uh, it would be great to have any of you. Just pop your head in say hello, or you can stop and say something to everyone. Uh, that's all I have. If any of you have any questions, I would like to try and answer them. No promises. Mr. Keltner. Out of, out of curiosity, yeah. was, the, um, was the cash component part of the public speaking course? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't. Was that an add-in through your marketing that, that was an add-in. That was yeah. good. Uh, Trustee Cross and Trustee Lawson. Just to know for the record, Mr. Chair, that we're big fans here of Kansas State University in Johnson okay. County. You can put in a good word for me. We appreciate all the service. <laughs> Why did you pick K-State? My mom attended there. She did a few classes there, decided to do something else. Yeah. I like it. Wildcats. That'd be awesome. Your meetings are still Mondays at 1 in the Mondays, queue. 12 to 1 12 in to RC 2. 12 to 1. 2 something. 217. Trustee Musil, did you have a comment? I think it's all been said. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sopcich. Uh, where did you go to high school? Uh, Turner High School, just across County Line. I'm about two blocks in. Yeah, that's great. And your, what's your favorite class here? Favorite class? I would have to say it was probably macroeconomics with Dan Owens. Really? Great professor. Excellent. Good to hear. Thank you. You did a Thank wonderful you. job. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Well, Mr. Carter, you again have, again have an opportunity to follow that. You take your cash. College lobbyist report. <laughs> Always. <laughs> well, the good news is the election is finished. We uh, now have some new leaders. The phone calls have stopped coming into your phones, and the uh, mailbox is a little bit lighter. Amen. Um, 
it's, uh, it's great to be able to report that we have some, some new office holders. Uh, Governor-elect uh, Laura Kelly, current sitting state senator, uh, is our new governor, along with um, State Senator Lynn Rogers as her uh, running mate. And um, she, um, she took the top spot. All of the other seats uh, remained Republican uh, in the statewide office holders. Um, Attorney General Derek Schmidt and State Treasurer Jake LaTurner retained their two seats. And then we saw um, Vicki Schmidt, who's a current sitting senator, uh, take the insurance commissioner's race and uh, Representative Scott Schwab won the race for Secretary of State. So again, all of those people will be uh, working to transition into their new roles as, uh, as the new year gets ready to turn. The legislature comes back to Topeka on the 14th of January, and so there will be a lot of pomp and circumstance on that day um, with swearing in, um, with the inaugural activities um, shortly thereafter, um, lots of activity that will be changing, changing faces, changing places uh, in Topeka. This was not an election year in the Senate, but we're going to see four new faces in the Senate. Um, just before um, uh, the elections uh, got started, or kind of right in the middle between the primary and the uh, general, uh, State Senator Steve Fitzgerald uh, resigned his position, and the Central Committee got together and elected Kevin Braun uh, to that Senate seat. I believe it's the fifth Senate uh, district. And, uh, and so he will be representing uh, that area of, of Northeast Kansas over uh, in the Leavenworth, Lansing, uh, and a little bit of uh, Johnson County uh, area. Similarly, uh, we will see the Central Committee come together to elect um, three additional senators, um, with three of those uh, being elected to statewide office. And so uh, with Vicki Schmidt, Laura Kelly, and uh, Lynn Rogers being elected, uh, we will see some new uh, faces in those seats as well. Uh, that means that there will be some shuffling of the chairs um, in the Senate, uh, and, and I don't mean just chairs, because a few of those people are chairs, um, but, but there will be some different committee assignments made. We're, we're waiting to see what the, the makeup of, of the uh, Senate leadership will look like. I'm not hearing of any change right now. That was a, a rumor that we had heard early on. Um, it's, we still could see something like that. Um, but, but we'll know uh, as, as we get closer to the start of the legislative session when, when those groups start meeting to, to kind of determine the direction that they're going to go. Much of the first part of this report was analysis that, that I um, put together after uh, the election occurred. Um, there have been several changes since then, and there are going to continue to be some changes. There were a number of incredibly close races that occurred uh, this particular election. And we're still waiting to hear the outcomes of several of those. One uh, that, that we already do know is a race that was in Newton, uh, where the incumbent was believed to, to be knocked off. But the recount showed uh, with the provisional ballots and mail-in ballots that uh, Tim uh, Hodge uh, did, in fact, defeat Steve Kelly for that. So that, that changes the numbers back to, um, to where they should be or where they were prior. Uh, we're also waiting results on a hand recount in southeast Kansas between Adam Lusker and Ken Collins. And then um, there's another race uh, out in western Kansas or in the Hayes area that is also being recounted today. And so again, those numbers could change, and that changes um, potentially the, the number of whether it's Democrats or Republicans. The Republicans still hold the majority in the House, uh, but again, those are numbers that, will, that, that could change uh, the outcome of the final numbers. When we start looking at the makeup of the House, we still think that there are around 33 to 35 moderates um, as far as uh, in the Republican Party. And there's multiple factions, um, uh, not only uh, within the Republican Party, but even within conservatives, there's, there's different factions. And when you combine those with the 40 or so, and, and that number could grow, uh, Democrats, you have a very good working majority for working items across the, the House floor and, and sending them over to the Senate. But again, there's still some unknowns that, that we're waiting to, to, uh, to find out. The, uh, the strange happenings across the state were, were not uh, immune to that us here in Johnson County. Uh, we saw several um, races that, that were upset, uh, either from an incumbent standpoint or in the uh, primary election, uh, and even uh, as recent as the, as the general election. 12 incumbents were reelected in Johnson County. 14 of those are Republicans, 10 are Democrats. 
And in most, uh, I think when you look at the analysis, the Democrats picked up four seats uh, in Johnson County uh, over, over Republican office holders who, who either had uh, the office before uh, or who were, they were challenging in, uh, in the general election. Lots of unknowns yet in leadership races. We think that uh, there, are, there are no announced challengers, at least to Ron Reichman, who is the Speaker of the House as of yet. Um, right now, there are three uh, folks that um, have indicated that they are in the race for majority leader. Um, that's Don Heineman, who's the current majority leader. Uh, Dan Hawkins, who is from the Wichita area and has been the House Health and Human Services Chair and holds a number of other uh, chairmanships in the House. And then Ron Highland, who uh, lives in Wamego, is a retired veterinarian. And, uh, and so there will be uh, at least um, three folks in that race. I think that if um, they're all good at counting, uh, and that's what the majority leader does, is count noses, count votes. And I think that we could see um, the current, uh, we could see someone drop out if, if the votes are not there to fill that race. But when you, when you get into those House election scenarios, um, they're, they're runoffs. And so depending on, on who wins the first ballot or who <laughs> wins that first round, it sometimes changes allegiances to, to who supports who for those different leadership uh, races. We're also hearing that uh, J.R. Clays and Blake Carpenter are running for majority whip. Again, names that might not mean anything right here, but when, when you start counting noses, um, we, we kind of pay attention to those things over in Topeka. On the Democrat side, uh, we're hearing that Tom Sawyer from Wichita uh, is interested in the, the minority leader post. He's held that position before, but he's also on the short list for a number of other positions. He might um, be a candidate to fill the, the uh, empty uh, Senate seat for Lynn Rogers. Um, he's been talked about for a number of appointments uh, in the uh, Kelly administration. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens there. The, uh, that kind of gives you a sense as to where things uh, are going in the House. But again, we're still sorting out the various rumors that are out there, and we're now in that stage for, for the leadership races, which will take place on December 3rd in Topeka. Uh, and they'll come to, the, the House members will come to Topeka and, and elect from within their own ranks their new leadership. With regard to budget, um, again, a lot has happened over the past week. Uh, on Friday of last week, the Consensus Revenue Estimating Group met and uh, made the determination that the state was ahead of projections, $306.4 million to date. That's four months in to the fiscal year. They're, they are projecting that by the end of the fiscal year, uh, June 30, 2019, that will be $905 million, or nine, 905 million uh, ahead. That, uh, that can be good news. Uh, it creates a lot of budget issues, too, um, because the Legislative Budget Committee just yesterday heard the list of enhancement requests from state agencies uh, that came into the tune of, of a little more than uh, $1 billion. Well, if we only have 900 more than we're expecting, you're not going to be able to fund uh, a billion worth anyhow, and we probably wouldn't any anyway. So there is going to be um, a lot of... Uh, um, discussion about how that works. Uh, we won't really probably take it up until end of March um, and, and in that April part where, where legislators go on break and the budget committees come back. That seems to be the, the trend of how we're doing things now. Uh, but uh, the good news is that there is money in the state's bank account. We still have to address the courts issue uh, with K-12 funding. Uh, and, and a number of, of agency requests um, that uh, have been backlogged for so long that we'll see, we'll see that come through, not to mention our very own, which is um, the, the increase, the restoration of the budget for higher education. And again, that remains the, the region's institution's number one priority. The, um, in other news, uh, we, you know, there are partners that we work with uh, all throughout the legislative session, and um, it's probably not a secret that Tom Robinette is uh, retiring at the end of the month at the Overland Park Chamber. Um, they've hired his replacement. It's Kevin Walker, and Kevin is a, a great guy. Kevin's someone I knew that when I worked at the American Heart Association uh, back in the 90s, and that's where he's been for the past 16 or so years. Um, he was a volunteer there and, uh, and, and still... Um, uh, was working up until he was uh, hired over at the Overland Park Chamber. And so 
We'll welcome him to uh, Topeka. He's not uh, new in Topeka. He's over in the State House quite a bit. But again, we work closely with the, the Chamber on a number of initiatives. In fact, we supported uh, their testimony uh, on the 69 Highway <coughs> issue at the recent Transportation Visioning Task Force. The, uh, the transition team uh, was named publicly uh, early this week. Um, those folks began working uh, on Friday last week, and actually were probably working a little before that, but they opened their office uh, on the west wing of the second floor in the State House on Friday of last week. And again, they are um, names that, that we're very familiar with for the most part. Uh, Dwayne Gosen uh, will, will be on that transition team. Dwayne has served uh, in the State House uh, as a legislator uh, in the appropriations process, served as a budget director for a number of governors, uh, and served as the Secretary of Administration uh, as well. Um, similarly, Natalie Haig, who was the Chief of Staff for uh, Governor Graves at one point in his administration, will be on that team. And I think it just demonstrates the, the bipartisan nature that um, Governor-elect Kelly said that she would bring to the table. Both of those people are Republicans. Just so happens that Natalie's sister is uh, outgoing Congresswoman Lynn Jenkins. The, uh, the other two names that are on there are Joyce Alagrucci. Uh, Joyce served uh, under the Sebelius administration as chief of staff and served early on on that transition team as well. Her husband is a retired uh, Kansas Supreme Court uh, justice. And then uh, Jordana Ziegler, uh, who helped man or who managed the, the Kelly campaign, will be on that transition team. So things are up and running. They're vetting the uh, they're vetting candidates for for different agencies. Um, they are uh, looking at the budget. That's their number one priority: is developing that budget. They're in good hands with. Um, with Dwayne Gosen, uh, who has that, uh, that long time experience with the Kansas budget and has continued to monitor the Kansas budget uh, in some roles that he's taken on um, since, since that time in public service. A couple of other items just to, to call to your attention. Um, we will continue with the breakfast series um, that we've always uh, done and the breakfast and lunch meetings that we do with legislators before they go back to Topeka in January. Uh, we have a number of new faces, and so those settings provide a great opportunity for face-to-face -face conversations uh, to build those relationships that, that we need over in Topeka. And, and if, if you haven't already been contacted or responded, uh, I know that um, Terry Schlisch will be coordinating um, your participation in those, on those dates for those breakfasts. The final thing, uh, and, and I just learned this on a, on a conference call on the way over here, uh, the, uh, the date of the Higher Education Day at the State House was going to be um, January 17th. That is now going to be January 22nd. So uh, that is an update that, uh, that is late in, in the coming and, uh, and is something that we're already planning for here as far as our presence uh, in the State House on that day. So I would stop there, Mr. Chair, and, and answer uh, questions as I'm able. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Ingram. I just have one question. Um, you mentioned December 3rd is the date that they will select leadership. Is that also the day that they do their committee assignments? Well, committee assignments will come after that uh, because they'll, they'll have just um, figured out who the, who the various leaders are. And, I, and in the past, uh, the majority leader and the, the speaker have gotten together to discuss those, but it's, um, it really comes from the speaker's office. Uh, that comes later throughout the week. Um, okay. and, and it, and so then, similarly, the ranking minority members will also be appointed. Uh, and, then, and then the full committees are fleshed out over the, the course of the, the next few weeks um, before Christmas. Thank you. Any, uh, Trustee Lawson. I appreciate the update. I know when I first got the uh, legislative report, there are so many things that are changing so fast. And we had a friendly banter just recently, so it was kind of nice to see the changes. And there's still changes. I think Pittsburgh was just called. Uh, we have some of the races um, that are still outstanding in Hayes. We have the Johnson counties that were certified just about an hour ago. So you're right, the, the tide is shifting very quickly. Um, it's interesting to kind of, the one thing that was really surprised me was um, the minority leader for the Democratic caucus. So I know from, I had to check in on that because that was really surprising to hear from, uh, you said Tom Sawyer was interested in running for that. Um, so that, as I have a question about that. So if Governor-elect Laura Kelly is actively calling for the House Caucus to retain the ward for leadership, how is that going to play out when the session opens if the Democratic Caucus is now opposing their Democratic governor? Yeah, I, I can't answer that. That's, right. That is it's part of the politics and the game in Topeka that we play every day. 
mm -hmm. and, um, and there's no way to kind of predict what that looks like. Um, those, those folks are campaigning internally within their own caucuses. There was a dinner last night in Johnson County uh, for one of the, the leaders that's seeking an office, and, um, and that's occurring you know, within the caucuses kind of around the state, and, and so I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for you. It'll be interesting. Thank it you. It will be. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, uh, Mr. Carter. Appreciate it. Good luck. Next item, our committee reports and recommendation is the, and the first one is the audit committee. The audit committee met at 8 o'clock on Thursday, November 8th. Trustee Ingram and I attended, along with several staff. Um, uh, we heard a number of uh, reports. I've, we have two action items, and we'll deal with those first. Uh, Mr. Moyer, a partner with uh, Reuben Brown and his team, presented the draft of the annual financial statement report and the compliance report for year ended June 30th. By the way, this report's on pages one through four of your budget information. Uh, Mr. Moyer informed the committee that the college has received an unmodified opinion. Uh, before I read the recommendation for action, I, I think it's important for this board to, uh, to understand the presentation that uh, Mr. Moyer made. And I think there were a couple of things that stood out to me, and I'll have Trustee Ingram respond, but he was very, um, complimentary about the collaboration and the working relationships that take place on this campus from department to department. I had a chance in a, a telephone call with him earlier in the week, uh, and I followed up with that and said, well, you, you say that to all your clients, don't you? And he said, no, you don't understand. Uh, the, the, the collaboration, the culture of the departments working together on this campus are uh, very unique, and it's, it's a real joy and pleasure to work with this team. And uh, uh, then the second thing I'd ask about our internal audit process, and he said very few colleges, even universities, but certainly very few community colleges, have an internal audit team like JCCC has. And so you should be very, very proud of, of that. And so I wanted to thank all of you for supporting those initiatives and certainly thank uh, everybody on the team uh, for the culture we build. We're at, external auditor will, will be that complimentary in his remarks. Uh, Trustee Ingram, do you have any reaction to that? Um, reaction? You did a nice job. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he really kind of took the wind out of the sails. That was what, if I had had the opportunity to share something, I would have shared that. But I think it, um, it, we pointed out during the meeting that this is the kind of thing that we hear in these committee meetings that we need to bring forward and share to the board at a meeting so that you all hear the kind of conversations that are being held. So um, I think that would be the only thing that I would add is that you know in those committee meetings, we do have the opportunity for those kinds of engagements and it's important to share that, so thank you. Dr. Sopcich, comments? I think everything that's possible to have been said has was said, so thank you. We received a non-modified opinion and it was a very positive opinion. So with that, it is the recommendation of the Audit Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the administration's recommendation to accept the audited financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2018, and I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Can I say something? Yes, if please. I would like to commend Barbara and Rachel the entire financial team for putting all this together, Janelle, Justin. I mean, these audits are no easy feat. The comments that he made to you were reflective of all the hard work that they had put into it. So thank you all for, for getting that done. And what, there was no finding, right? Absolutely no finding. No findings. And I'd like to also add the financial aid audit is part of this, yes. and that is very complex. We obviously yeah. Uh, have a lot of financial aid dollars that run through the college, and Randy Weber and Crystal Williams do an outstanding job. A few dollars go through the college and involve a lot of people, so yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. The second item is uh, that the audit committee reviews the internal audit, audit committee charter policies contained in the board policies. Uh, and basically, basically what we spoke a lot about was the combination of the internal audit policy, policy 210.06, and the external audit policy 210.05 to uh, merge those into one policy called internal and external audit policies for 210.05. Uh, 
along with really non-material language modifications, which you have in your board packet that would combine those two. And it's part of the process we've been going through in terms of our, our audit process to um, streamline uh, the, uh, the, uh, the policies as effectively as we can. And so with that, it is the recommendation of the Audit Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the combination of internal audit policy 210.06 and external audit policy 210.06 into one policy titled Internal and External Audit Policies 210.05 and to approve the non-material language modifications as set forth below. And you'll see that those changes really uh, are, are um, go from singular to plural uh, usage of verbs uh, in those policies. And with that, I would make that motion. Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We had a very interesting discussion about uh, the business continuity plan. And uh, is there any trustee who's bold enough to think what they might know what the business continuity plan entails? And Nancy Ingram can't speak because she heard the presentation. Anybody we'll allow know? continuity of business. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I knew that, uh, Kansas State University, Greg, that, yeah. that you would uh, know that. Well, the business continuity plan is something that uh, we probably take for granted, but it has to do with if there is any kind of emergency situation a tornado, a hurricane, which we wouldn't have here most likely, but a flood, uh, an explosion, a fire. Earthquake. A earthquake. Anything that would break up the regular routine of business as usual on the campus. And uh, th this is an example uh, where, again, uh, I think we as trustees have to understand it's a very timely process. So the team is engaging a survey right now to find out what our faculty, staff, team feels are the threats to this campus from a business continuity plan, and then to put together a very extensive plan of action. Uh, and I thought, Dr. Larson, it was very interesting uh, in your experience down in Florida where you had put such a plan in place and thought you kind of knew the answers until you did the test, and you even knew the test was coming. It's kind of like a fire drill. Uh, uh, but, but gee, we, we maybe aren't as prepared as we thought we should be. So I really applaud uh, the college for taking this on and making sure that hopefully we never have to implement such a plan, but uh, very interested and concerned about the safety and the security of our employees, uh, our students, and uh, that, that's a key part of the whole operation is how do we, how do we protect our the people that live here and work here and learn here every day. Uh, Nancy, do you want to say anything about it? I, 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 we, we spent quite a bit of time on it, and it was really kind of an interesting uh, discussion. It, it was. Um, I think it's just something that we all take for granted that there won't be anything. <laughs> then if there is, how do we respond to that? So I think it's, it's the timeliness of this is extremely important, so I appreciate staff and their work on that, because it's going to take a lot of work. So thank you very much. Have a comment about it? Yes, I do. Okay, please. Thank you. Um, Justin's about ready to jump out of his chair. Do you have any uh, comments since you were the presenter? Uh, no, I, I, I say the trustees characterized it very well. I think that we're uh, in the process of, of, as Trustee Cook said, trying to gather input from all across campus. We're working closely with our partners in information services um, who are also engaged in an analysis of their own, uh, because obviously that's a very important part of business continuity, and uh, we look forward to working with everyone on campus to come up with a plan. Thanks, Justin. Uh, it, it's uh, it's again this whole this whole issue about how we protect our data, how we protect our people is, is not to be taken lightly, so thank you for the efforts you have in that regard. That, that is the one thing that I would also add to the conversation is it started out being very business oriented, and Jerry brought it back to the people who are on this campus, not only our students, but our staff, and I think I, you know, I, that just, again, it's something that we all assume, but I appreciate your being very specific about that too, thank, thank because you. we thank do you. care about the people on this campus, so. Thank you. Thank you. We had a report on cloud and vending computing strategies audit. Uh, we had quarterly projects update. Uh, I would say also that uh, we will be in the process, the internal audit team on a routine basis uh, does internal audits of departments. And uh, many times those departments even seek out when can you do our department. 
and again, that goes back to the culture of, uh, of understanding that the audit is there to help us get better and help us to be more efficient and not necessarily uh, always there to catch somebody doing something wrong, but hopefully at the same time, we catch people doing things right and can reinforce that as best practices. Um, we have uh, the audit recommendations follow-up matrix. We have the JCC ethics report line. Uh, all reports that have been received uh, have been dealt with as of September 30th, 2018. All complaints have been reviewed and appropriately addressed. Uh, of cases previously reported in the process, all have been addressed. So the ethics report line is working well, and uh, we're responding accordingly. Um, in the cloud discussion, uh, I had to admit uh, a sin of mine, and that is that when we're dealing with the computing and and uh, internet work, I, I said that my biggest frustration daily is remembering my passwords. And then uh, I had the terrible thing happen of in my old iPad, it just went black one day. And I couldn't get it on, I couldn't get it to work, I got a new iPad and I thought, oh gee, what am I gonna do? And so I did what uh, I thought was a good thing and that was to hit the uh, on button, uh, which I did and then the computer said hello and you want to continue in English, which I thought I made a good decision and said yes. And, um, and then it led me through a couple of other steps. And uh, my, my uh, Adobe Acrobat has all of my board agendas and all my board data, all my schedule is in there, all my contacts, and I thought I've lost everything. And all of a sudden, it said, do you have it in the cloud? And so I looked up and wondered, and I, yes, and there, there it all was. There was my calendar, there was my, or my contacts, there was all my data. Uh, I don't know how the cloud works. Uh, we what were, is your password? We're, <laughs> uh, we're auditing. Nobody knows Write how the that cloud down. works. I think, I think it's go Wildcats, but I don't remember. But, uh, so whenever we talk about auditing the cloud, I have uh, the highest respect and regard for whatever is up there in that cloud. But anyway, any questions about the audit committee? Jerry Cook, you made me cry. Why did you do yeah, that? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, next item is collegial steering. And as uh, Nancy was so kind to compliment me for bringing the people back into the, uh, the discussion for uh, the uh, business continuity plan, I had that same high degree of regard when I totally overlooked the collegial steering committee and missed it. And uh, that's one of the first times I've just missed the meeting, and I just missed it. So I apologize to the committee and... Nancy will give that report. I had to call in. Um, collegial steering, I would just remind everyone of who is a part of collegial steering. We have some, uh, several people from administration. Dr. Cook and I both serve on that as well as two representatives from Faculty Senate, Faculty Association, and Ed Affairs is also represented on that committee. We had not met because of the negotiation pro um, process that we had been a part of, and so I think we were all looking forward to getting back together and truly having some good conversations. I did leave the room for a couple of minutes. I wasn't gonna tell anyone why I left the room, but they kind of started uh, the conversation. So when I walked in the room, um, instead of looking at the agenda and the items on the agenda, we just kind of talked, which I found very, very valuable. Some highlights of our discussion um, included, and Dr. Subject, I'll let you add it, you know, at the end, um, to convey that there is continued interest in involvement with student pathways, uh, the faculty certainly hopes that they will continue to engage uh, throughout the campus with those discussions. Um, there is a desire for a clearer understanding of the PROMISE program and the goals on our campus. And I think one of the comments that was made that I wrote down was it's not just about giving people money. So as we're moving forward with discussions on all of this, certainly to uh, continue to involve <coughs> faculty as a part of that. Discussion regarding professional memberships and the positive impact that additional dollars would make on those, uh, that was part of our discussion. And then also interest in identifying um, uh, the competencies that companies need right now and the interest in incorporating those competencies into the transfer courses. Um, so those were a couple of the highlights. There were many things that we discussed, but I think that those will provide some good agenda topics as we move forward this year. So, I thought Sachi. there was great exchange. Um, around the table. Right. I really appreciated the insights from the faculty with regards to some things that um, could have, could potentially help instruction. Um, and it was, they did a great job presenting those ideas. So I thought it was a, a fantastic start to get collegial steering back on track. You bet. Okay. You bet. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> we Human will be reaching out for agenda items. 
Yep, I think that'll go out tomorrow or Monday. Okay. So. Perfect. Human Resources, Trustee Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Human Resources Committee did not meet uh, in the month of November. We are scheduled to meet. Did I get that wrong? Sorry. Barb leaned forward and no. made me, no. made me nervous. No sudden movements. I apologize. <laughs> they, we will meet on Monday, December 3rd uh, in this building. So that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, learning quality, Trustee Lawson. Thank you. Uh, learning quality, we have, you could see in your board packet on page six and nine, there was a uh, really uh, amazing sabbatical. All the sabbaticals are really great information, and we have the privilege as some of the trustees here of listening to them. And this one was uh, really interesting. There was some discussion about critical thinking and how to operationally define what critical thinking really is um, in the classroom. And the discussion was also to include the business side. So when business owners come to us and ask us, we would like our student or our employees to have critical thinking, we need to be able to ask them, what does that mean for you? Because that can look different from our side to their side. So uh, that was really interesting. And then uh, we had a great uh, presentation of the Department of uh, Arts and Designs, Humanities and Social Services. That is a very long acronym. <laughs> but we had a good time. Uh, and the minutes in there really reflect what we talked about, so I won't re repeat that. In the consent agenda, you will see that Dr. Singh um, has made a recommendation for some affiliate art agreements. And that is on page 36 and 37 of the packet. Uh, and then Dr. Hopper did uh, an Ed Affairs uh, evaluation of the curriculum and also deactivated some of the curriculum there. So that is on page 34 and 35. The final note is uh, I was able to attend uh, Dr. Hopper's um, Ed Affairs Committee with the invitation that he gave us in the learning quality. Uh, and it was very informative, uh, very informative. Uh, to the process of all the professors to come together and really um, hold each department accountable for the quality of education. So it was really um, great to see the process of when programs are first um, uh, introduced, but then also the process of when they need to be terminated. Uh, and with that, I'll turn that over to my other trustees in the room and see if there's any other well, comments. Well, nothing to Okay. Thank you, Trustee Lawson. Appreciate it. Management, Trustee Lindstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the Management Committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, uh, November 7, 2018, in room 44 of the Industrial Training Center, or ITC, building. Uh, before I present our report, I want to thank uh, Executive Vice President Barbara Larson and her staff, particularly Linda Nelson, who's not here this evening, for planning uh, in, uh, all, for the planning involved holding our meeting management committee meeting at a different campus location. I also want to thank the staff at Bur Burlington Northern Santa Fe, BNSF, as they were terrific hosts for us as well. Overall, I believe it was an enjoyable experience, and I know that many who attended had never been in that room or perhaps even in that building before, so I was glad we were able to do that. Um, Barbara, any comments on? No, thank okay. you. Uh, the management committee received several reports from staff, <coughs> and the information related to the meeting begins on page 10 and runs through page 14 of the, of the packet. Um, Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President of Finance and Administrative Services, presented information on an agreement with Olathe Medical Center for facility use of the Olathe Health Education Center, or OHEC, location. This agreement can be found on, in the consent agenda on page 37 of the board packet. Rachel Lears, uh, Associate Vice President for Finance, Finance, Financial Services and Chief Financial Officer, provided a semi-annual update of the college's investments in the Kansas Municipal Investment Pool. Next, Rachel uh, reviewed the five-year projection model of the college finances. For next fiscal year, the model incorporates a preliminary budget guideline for fiscal 2019-2020, uh, which was reviewed by the uh, Management Committee at its October meeting. Included <coughs> in the pro proposed guideline is a tuition rate increase of $1 per credit hour for Johnson County students, which would make that go from $93 to $94 per credit hour a $2 credit hour uh, for in-state students, 
which makes that rate go from $110 to $112, and a $3 credit hour uh, out for out-of-state students, which goes from $220 to $223 per credit hour, and the metro rate uh, was also a $3 increase, and that goes from $135 to $138. Uh, it is important to note that the college has held tuition rates flat for the last three years. I think that's very important, three consecutive years. And as a reminder, this board is to vote on the budget guidelines, including the proposed increase to tuition at our December board meeting of trustees. Uh, the management committee uh, reviewed other aspects of the five-year projection model, including potential increases in assessed valuation, and capital spending in the future, including investments in the science lab renovation um, by the fiscal year 2021. Uh, we will continue to review the model of, uh, we will continue a review of the model at the December Management Committee meeting. Um, the next report was from Janelle Vogler, Interim Vice, Associate Vice President, President for Business Services. She presented a single source report as well as a summary of the awarded bids between $50,000 and $150,000. The summary is on page 10 of the board packet. Then we heard from Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President of Campus Services and Facility Planning. He gave a monthly update on capital infrastructure projects, and this report is on page 11 of the packet. He also provided information on current progress of construction projects on the campus. He reviewed the report of financial status of facilities master plan projects, and that report is on page 12 of the packet. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have no recommendations this month, and I think that's the first time in my recollection that management has not had a, a recommendation for this body, at least in my time on the, on the management committee. Um, and I would open it up to Trustee Snyder or Trustee Musil if they had anything to add. Trustee Musil. I would, uh, on the five-year modeling for our budget that will both inform the budget guidelines for, for the upcoming fiscal year that we'll vote on in December, and then for the out years, um, I had some questions and, and had asked if, uh, if we could do some stress testing of that, if you will, uh, given that we are in the we're right now in the longest uh, economic recovery um, in modern American history, and that suggests that there might be a dip at some point and stress test that to see where our, what happens to our revenues if we don't have assessed valuation growth. And we know that historically that will mean a lot more students if there is a, an economic uh, pause or downturn, which is good for tuition but, but help, increases our costs. So uh, I thought it was important that we try to measure that based on historical data. And also that we review the level of our cash reserves. Um, we are well above our policy number and that may mean we are too high or that our policy number is too low. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to look at both of those when we talk about how we uh, receive and spend uh, tax dollars. And I appreciate the responsiveness of staff on that. Good points, thank you, appreciate that. There's just a question about manage on page 10. Um, I know there was a single bidder for the commercial insurance brokerage services. Um, there were seven notices that were sent out and only one came back. After looking at the bidding policy, I know that typically we like to have three, but it's you know something that can be qualified for one. Is that typically a normal response for this one company to come back or is this, is this unusual? It's, it happens at times that there's only one response, and I know that um, we've had uh, very good rates from Thomas McGee in the past, um, so perhaps that was that was known uh, okay. out in the community. So yeah, historically that is the good rate. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I just kind of wanted to find out. In, in the single source uh, uh, reporting, um, I think the, the management committee is pretty cognizant of uh, and, and sensitive to uh, low bids and then also um, who's getting the bids and when they're coming. Right, thank you. And if I may, yeah. Mr. Chair, sir. Yes. Uh, I, and I served on that committee with you, Trustee Lundstrom. I, I concur, those meetings typically take longer to my memory, the two years I was on there. And we spent quite a bit of time going through that. Not just to, for information. 
purposes. I'm sorry, what were you? We spent quite a bit of time looking at single source bidding process mm -hmm. and expenditures and just going through, I, I promise you, Trustee Lindstrom and Cook, anyway, when I was with them, they spent quite a bit of time going through that. So it was a good question. I'm just. Yeah, I just wanted uh, to know historically, how do we decide if that's a good price? But yeah. Yeah. Trustee Musil, did you have a, uh, I'm sorry, are you finished? I had a question if I'm, okay. what was let the me, change? Go, let, me, let me finish with, did you have a follow up that you wanted? I, I just, this, just so everybody's clear, this wasn't a single source contract. That's right. This was a bid process and only one, one bidder responded. Mm -hmm. It happened to be our incumbent bidder who has been very good for us both on, we think on the fees they charge us and in getting us insurance rates that have, That's correct. I don't think they've increased in the, la in the seven years I've been on the board. So it, there, we, as long as we have an opportunity and we put our professional services out for the community to bid on, then I'm very comfortable that if somebody thought they could do significantly better, we would have seen it. Did you finish your questioning about the stress testing and other things before I interrupted you? Did you want staff to respond to any of that tonight or? No. no. Okay. We're, we're going to see okay. it again at management committee and then the board will see it next month. So okay. Very I'm good. Fine. Trustee Cross. Thank you. And I thank Trustee Musil for correcting me. I misspoke. Um, <clears throat> what were the changes in tuition, may I ask again? Um, okay. One dollar per credit hour for students, uh, for Johnson County students. $2 per credit hour for in-state students, $3 per credit hour for out-of-state students, and for the metro rate. I thank you for that, and I thank the administration for keeping tuition where it's been, and perhaps it's time to move it, so thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, questions of management? Rex, let me put you on the spot a little bit, being we have a few uh, workers running around the campus. Can you give a 60-second uh, or two-minute commercial on the status of the projects? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Or? Right now, for the Career and Technical Education Building, uh, we're pretty much we're on time, on schedule right now. The FADS building is a little bit more concerning to me. Uh, you know, as you know, we plan on uh, moving in that building. The, actually the second week of uh, January. Uh, but, <clears throat> so we had a lot of weather days and it's just really tight right now. So my eyes are on that project and you know, we're working with Jay Dunn to see what efficiencies they can make to you know, speed that process up and ensure that we do uh, meet our schedule. But that's, that's what I'm concerned about right now. But other than that, the projects are going well. Rex, I just want to say that uh, Nancy mentioned earlier about uh, safety and security of people on campus. Appreciate the signage, appreciate the fences, I appreciate the pathways. I, we've got a lot of work going on all over the campus, front door, back door, side door, and uh, I know that takes a lot of extra attention to make sure that uh, we, we minimize any kind of uh, mishap that may occur. So thank you very much with that. Any questions anybody has on that? Mr. Okay. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Trustee Lindstrom. Next item is the nominating committee. It's that time of the year again where we uh, elect officers for this board. Uh, I've chosen, uh, asked Trustee Lindstrom and Trustee Ingram to serve on the nominating committee. They'll meet with Dr. Sobchuk and set a plan. We'll plan to have recommendations for officers at our December board meeting, and those officers then will take effect in, at the January board meeting. Uh, President's recommendations for action. Treasurer's report, Trustee Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the board packet contains the treasurer's report for the month ended September 30th, 2018. Some items of note include uh, page one of the treasurer's report is the general post-secondary technical education funds summary. September was the third month of the college's 2018-19 fiscal year. An ad valorem tax distribution of $4,683,287 was received from the county treasurer during September and was uh, distributed as shown in the report. Uh, during September, the college made the final principal and interest payment on the series 2009 certificates of participation for the OHEC in the amount of $3,398,981. An ad valorem tax <coughs> distribution of 1.2 million was received in October and will be reflected in next month's report college's unencumbered cash balances of September 30th, 2018 in all funds was 101.5 million, which is approximately 2.6 million higher than at the same time last year. Consequently, Mr. Chair, expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits 
and it is the recommendation of the college administration that this board approve the treasurer's report for the month ended September 30, 2018, subject to audit. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any questions? Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Trustee Cross. Uh, monthly report to the board, Dr. Sopcich. Thank you, Trustee Cook. Um, hopefully you've all had a chance to review the monthly report to the board. It's kind of fascinating. All the activities and accomplishments that are reflected in this report every month. It's a real tribute to um, everybody on campus for the hard work they put in every single day here and also the student success for which they all work toward. Um, and this, move, this meeting's moving at a lightning pace, so to honor that, we're going to have the lightning round this evening. Um, back by popular demand, uh, we'd like to um, get started with Dr. Larson, Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Sopcich and members of the board. Um, I'd like to give you an update on the college's meal share program. This program was first piloted last spring semester. The program has been led by Jason Arnett and Claudia Martin Ayoade, staff members in dining services, uh, with a great deal of support from across the campus. In addition to our food pantry, Jason and Claudia wanted to create a program which would assist our students who may face food insecurity issues while they are here on campus. The meal share program enables students to receive up to $7 per day to be used at any of our dining services venues. So far this fall semester, we have helped 76 students. They have swiped their student IDs about 3,900 times and have been provided food valued at nearly $18,000 so far um, this semester. Um, eligibility for the program is based on need and we were not able to honor all of the submitted requests for the semester. I'm happy to report, however, that on this month's consent agenda, there is notice of a grant award to help close this gap. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City is awarding the college $10,000 for mm. this program. We hope this will allow us to add another 15 people for the next several semesters, and we will continue to explore ways to make the program more sustainable in the future. But in the meantime, uh, this program is making a real difference for um, some of our neediest students. So thank you. All right. Any questions for Barbara? Do you know how many were not awarded? Um, I believe that we received um, close to 130 applications, and we were able to honor these 76. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Food insecurity is, is, is unfortunately very common at community college campuses. Across the country, schools are addressing this with various programs. We're real proud of what we've been able to do mm -hmm. and, and, and how that has been executed uh, and the good work that it does. So thank you very much, Barbara. Um, next, Dr. Weber. All right, for my portion, I'm going to be so forward thinking, I'm going to take you back to the 2014-17 strategic plan. Um, in our previous strategic plan, there were two key themes that, that we took out of it that we, we, we've marched forward. The first being better support for self-navigating stu students, and the second being consistent advice students receive across campus. And from that, we developed some work where we developed a, a, a homegrown student success tool. We built it in Banner. It was very clunky. We, we used the logic behind our, our, uh, our admissions application for selective admissions programs where it had checklists. Students uh, were interactive, and they recognized when they had stuff in, and they quit uh, reaching out to see, see if, if there were more, more materials due. So we took that, that knowledge, built this plan um, that got some really positive um, reviews and energy, but what happened was for a student to update their information, it had to be self-reported. So we knew we were kind of with the success plan mindset uh, onto something, but we needed to develop something that would be enterprise-wide um, and it would automatically update a student's plan when they participate in activity because they wanted that real-time update. Uh, so what we did is we put out an RFP and, and, and just about a year ago we made the decision and implemented a tool called AccuCampus. And I'm not, I'm not here to purely just tell you that, that AccuCampus is the right tool. I'm telling you that the journey that we're on is what's been really powerful. So during this implementation what we've done is all of our service centers, both academic support services and non-academic support services have implemented the same check-in system so we're able to track and support students activities across campus so when if, if a faculty member were to decide um, I want you you know an academic support service uh, and achieving courses say I want you to go do a, a resume building class 
class in there, they could assign that and then they would be able to be known when, that, when those students completed that task as part of that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful opportunity for us. Um, so so that's, that's kind of what's really exciting, but, but really what we're doing now is foundational work for what, what's really what's to come and, and we think to be the most forward-thinking part of this. And so what we're doing now is tracking the student activity across campus and ultimately be able to tell um, how students' engagement with different areas of our campus, along with their input data information they're telling us, is impacting their success so that we can impact the decisions of future students. There's a quote in community colleges, Kay McClenney is famous for saying it, where she says students don't do optional. And we don't necessarily ask students to do mandatory. And I think the happy compromise here is that students will make choices that are informed. And so what we're trying to do to provide consistent advice to students across campus is inform those decisions. And rather than using the anecdote where people use their experiential data and say, well, I had this experience and it worked, or, or I told somebody else to do this, we kind of watch the student experience and we inform it. So rather than the old um, steps to enrollment that said, first you apply, then you do financial aid, then you register, and, and everybody had the same one, we'll have contextualized uh, student plans based on the student's input data and their behavioral plans. And, and it's, it's um, something that takes, it's gonna take us years to grow and build, but the foundational work we're doing now is already getting some really net gains. As a matter of fact, as we're preparing for um, this next year's budget process, so areas that haven't been able to log student activity have been presenting them in preparation for staffing requests and budget needs and like, look at this activity that's gone up in our area. So we're really excited about, like I said, that movement where areas are able to articulate their student traffic and in time we're going to be able to really talk about how that, that traffic and those activities are most importantly helping us impact student success. Any questions? Terrific, Randy. Thank you. Um, Dr. McLeod. Well, when we were asked to talk about innovations, I had a long, long list of things, and I, and I was told I need to keep it short. So um, what I'll do is I'll look at kind of three different facets of what we do in touching students. One of the things that we're uh, doing that is innovative is we're starting to look a little bit at um, open educational resources in some new ways. We're looking at the digital footprint that the campus has, and we have a faculty committee being led by Barry Bailey, one of our librarians who focused on open educational resources as part of his sabbatical. So we're seeing the fruits of the sabbatical process being uh, borne out with faculty talking about how we integrate OER more into our classrooms and how we look at aggregating the larger kind of ecosphere uh, in the digital world that is OER and what ways we can bring that in to make it more searchable, make it easier for faculty to have access to those resources so they can pull them into their classrooms. Overall, it will save our students a great deal of money because we'll be able to kind of design our own digital platforms and digital textbooks as opposed to kind of continuing to grow with the exorbitant price of texts as we've seen that jump over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and looking at kind of how we govern ourselves and work. Um, one of the innovations that we're bringing to the table with the faculty is that we'll be instituting the National Chair Academy for the first time on this campus, uh, and we'll be bringing that this summer so that our faculty who act um, as department chairs will have an opportunity to work through some projects. It is a year-long kind of process that involves uh, two bookended weeks, um, one at the front end for the training and then one at the back end to go back in and look at what we've learned and processed over the year and the way in which we act as department chairs. What are those roles? How are they connected to what happens outside of the classroom? What are the administrative pieces that faculty need to learn to be able to manage better in terms of budget, in terms of understanding long-range planning and SMART goals? So it's going to allow us to really build on the faculty chair model so that our faculty has not simply access to that role, but actually access to all of the assistance we can give them to help them learn to administer their programs in um, new and more streamlined ways, uh, make that work more positive for them and more effective for what we're doing with our programs as we grow and change and look at how we um, migrate programs. Uh, and then. As we touch kind of the overall community, we're working right now with KU Edwards. We met today um, with a contingent of our faculty and deans going down to meet with KU Edwards faculty um, and provosts 
to talk about the creation of three new, what we're calling Johnson County communities um, to forward student learning, uh, which will allow us to pipeline students into three new programs that we're trying to, to build with KU Edwards, which will result in Johnson County residents being able to get a complete four-year degree with the first two years here, the second two years there, leading to a degree in English um, through the School of Languages and Literatures, a uh, degree in Business Administration, which will be a, a BBA, the Bachelor's of Business Administration, um, and we're actually looking at possibly cohorting that particular program to move students through all of the classes here on our campus mm -hmm. um, in, in a four-year fashion. Um, and then a degree in Law and Society, which will lead um, folks into corrections, into pre-law, into social work um, and into service fields that will then be able to give back to the community that they exist in and that they have built their degrees in. So I have a question. It's always been my understanding that KU Edwards campus was basically focusing on master's degree students. Is this a shift in their thinking quite dramatically? It is. Um, they have seen what we do here and they want to be um, a part of being the rest of that four-year pipeline for students because we see um, the difficulty in students both in wanting to leave Johnson County but also in being able to have the funding to go and live in those dorms when their families are here and that commute sometimes can take a toll on those students. So we're really working on building a pipeline to create that four-year experience in Johnson County for students who need that help here. And that toll most likely results in I drop my educational career path at that time because it's too difficult to go to Lawrence. Okay, cool. Trustee Lawson. Um, thank you so much. Um, the open educational resources is very, something that's very interesting. When you look at the other community colleges in the country, what have they started to do with their bookstore? How does that start to impact that side? It really hadn't hit the community college level as, as deeply yet. Most OER is being utilized at the um, four-year level. Actually, in this state, and, and this will go to several jokes that have been made earlier, um, Brian Lynch, Lynch here, um, who was the outgoing faculty senate president at K-State, actually has been the leader right now in talking about OER and leading the faculty conversation at the university level. And no one has really kind of grabbed the reins uh, of this conversation at the community college level. So we saw this as an opportunity for us to get out front and really start to talk about how we as community colleges can join in the OER conversation. Our faculty here, you know, publish books and do as much research as anybody. How can we try and lead that for the two-year sector in a way that we have not gotten out there and done because it really has yet to have massive impact at the two-year level? Cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McLeod, I have to ask you, um, will Iowa State have any players left to play this week after all the ejections <laughs> last year or last week? Uh, by the second half, we will be back in the game. Okay. We'll, see, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, hopefully, they don't get any fights and, and all the backups get thrown out this week. <laughs> Thank you for those terrific reports, and that wraps up. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Lots uh, of things going on every day on this campus. I don't think we have any old business, no new business, so reports from Board Liaisons, Faculty Association, Dr. Harvey. Welcome. Well, this is the time in the semester where my grading pile is uh, depressingly large, and, um, and then I keep assigning things because I said I was going to in the syllabus, which is probably good. It keeps us moving forward. But, um, but yes, I, this is. I think we're all kind of the students are starting to get weary. They're ready for Thanksgiving, and hopefully they don't forget everything that they've learned. But um, this is kind of where we're at right now. Um, I think in the next month you're going to start hearing about student presentations and things. About this time of the semester, we start to see students presenting work and showcasing some of the things that they've done um, this semester. Because we are a community college, we do kind of, uh, we don't just save things like that for the spring, but you'll see things each semester because we often have our students for, you know, one semester at a time. Um, I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about some of the unique challenges our students face um, at a community college. I think most of us that have been around here very long are very aware of that, that um, when I go in my classroom, I'm talking and working with, um, with parents, um, some of them single, some of them have partners. 
Um, a lot of them are working way too much uh, and trying to be a student. Uh, sometimes my students are caring for parents or someone else that they're responsible for beyond children. They have other people that they need to look after. Um, they're often working multiple jobs sometimes even. And I know that um, at the management committee meeting this month, they talked a bit about tuition, and I know that we're talking about small tuition increase. And I just want to say like how important it is that we have, it is really significant that we've kept tuition um, the same for the last three years. And the proposed changes are very small, and I, I do appreciate that. And I, I did hear comments about, you know, should the tuition cost be a certain percentage of the total cost or not? And to that, I just wanted to, I did want to make a couple comments about that to consider. And one thing is that if you imagine that someone is working a minimum wage job, if you calculate how many hours they would have to work a week for the entire year to cover just the tuition alone, I think you have to consider things like that too. Because while the cost of living goes up, the cost of education goes up, their incomes don't necessarily go up to go along with that. And we are, we are often educating a, a population that is working minimum wage jobs. And so, um, so I think you have to consider that as we go forward. And I think that I really appreciate how, um, how uh, thoughtful um, our board has been and our uh, administration in not you know, adding to the financial burden by increasing tuition these last few years. But I just think that that is something to keep in mind as you go forward, as you start having conversations about should it be held at a certain percentage of the cost. The problem is that their, the, their incomes are not going up um, at the same rate. And financial aid that's available is not necessarily going up at the same rate either. So um, I just want to point that out. and. I also wanted to just talk about how much I appreciate some of the programs that we have for students um, to help them be successful. The food share program, and I'm really pleased to hear that that's gonna be expanding. Things like that, things like the Veterans uh, PAVE program that were just highlighted tonight are really important to our um, to certain populations of our students. I think um, a lot of the support services that we offer here allow students from, with different backgrounds to be successful. Um, in collegial steering, one of the things that I shared about was also uh, the importance of not just providing support services to sort of help students that are at a, um, come in maybe with a disadvantage of some way or maybe they aren't as privileged as other students, but also, um, opportunities, ways that we can offer, offer um, opportunities that sort of uh, set students apart, that help them compete for some of them, the better things later. Um, so for example, um, a lot of times students might, might not self-select for certain programs that are um, that give them special opportunities, like the honors program. We have that available, but they may not identify as like, hey, that's for me. They may not self-select for that. So one of the things that I've been encouraged by some of my colleagues to do, and a lot of you know about it, is um, how we've done research in our entire class, research projects with the entire class, everyone who takes a course. Um, in fact, all of microbiology is doing that, and then I have a course that's also doing that with them. Um, and the value of things like that, the value of having a course that is, has a service learning component, or a course that has something like a research opportunity built into the class, or um, some kind of a project that's a partnership with a business, and, and to have it available to every student who takes that class, the value of that is that it doesn't allow students to self-select out of it because they're too busy, or they can't afford an extra credit hour, or they, um, Maybe they don't think that it's for them. They don't think, well, I would do this exceptional thing. Um, and, and they don't usually go for those extra things. They're just hoping to pass the class. Um, the, the reality is that this gives the, everyone an opportunity to participate in those things. And so it's a benefit to every student. And sometimes some of the benefits are things like um, they have uh, early exposure to potential career opportunities that they might not have considered. 
That is one of the values that we have at community colleges. We see the students at the very beginning of their education. So we can really help guide them before they've gone too far into a career path. Um, they can decide if, hey, this is for me, or maybe this isn't for me. Okay, I know that's not for me, so I'm gonna try you know, something different. But um, we've had students who participated in something like that in their first semester and then decided, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue a biology degree now instead of, instead of becoming a nurse. And now they're in, you know, in, in school planning to go to grad school or planning to go to medical school. They might, might have a different path because they enjoyed something that they experienced in a class that they might not have had an opportunity like that otherwise. Um, so early exposure to opportunities in our classes is su super important to impacting career choices. A lot of times four-year institutions only give those opportunities to students in a capstone course um, at the end of their four years. And so that's one advantage that we have is that we can do that, we can do that early with first-year students. So many faculty are doing this sort of thing. Um, it's not just you know, it's not just in science, but many faculty are doing this sort of thing. And I think I would like to see, um, you know, just learn more ways like that that we can um, really help our students within the normal, our normal courses, their normal coursework, uh, to make their experience just exceptional. And when we talked about that, and I mentioned it, I know some of my colleagues pointed out that that takes some support services and professional development opportunities. And so, um, I'm excited to see you know, the new directions that our professional development uh, program here for faculty is taking and the new resources that are gonna be put into that. So I think those things are gonna help um, allow for opportunities for faculty to do those sorts of things. Um, oh, the other benefit I wanna mention from th that kind of thing is when you do something like that in, in a course, um, you have increased mentoring experience with the students. Even though there's one person and there's like 24, students say in my class, they get a, an experience of more one-on-one -on -one mentoring with me through doing a project like that within the course. And that's, that's been shown in, in research um, on these kinds of projects, so uh, that there is an increased mentoring experience. So anyway, I'd like to see a more support and incentive for those kinds of things, and I just wanted to mention that as just something I'm interested in too, not just our support services for our students, that because we, we do have a lot of need, and we wanna provide for um, students that are, when they have obstacles that are holding them back or keeping them from being successful. But we also want to give opportunity to our students to help them succeed and kind of go above and beyond and maybe stand out from, from the crowd when they go to apply for jobs, apply for um, programs beyond this place. So that concludes my report. Thanks, Dr. Harvey. Appreciate it. Trustee Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, President Harvey, thank you for that articulation. Uh, I, too, appreciate this uh, administration and board's uh, attempt to keep tuition where it is because um, my mother used to just take great pride coming here, I guess it was the old technical school when I was here, and how much money she had left over to take care of her family from a student loan check because Johnson County Community College was so dirt cheap. And I'm not sure we can buy that kind of organic uh, marketing and the opportunities they got to say take sociology and learn that the car is a great social equalizer and teach one of their sons to get in a car and go intern for Dennis Moore. Uh, it's a 17-hour drive to Washington, D.C., just so you know. <laughs> and so I, I thank you for your articulation, and I thank you for your service, and uh, I just wanted to say that. Trustee Cross, cost-effective, cost-effective, mm -hmm. not dirt cheap, cost-effective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, learning to talk. Is, yeah. is, is, is. Trustee uh, Lindstrom. I'm going I'm to reiterate some of the, the same topic, uh, Dr., Dr. Harvey. Uh, I appreciate your comments on tuition. Um, I agree with you that this board is very sensitive to uh, keeping it cost effective and uh, um, I think we, we will continue to do so, so thank you. Trustee Lawson. Um, very similar, so I appreciate you bringing that up because it is a concern of mine to make sure that it, um, the students that have access here, that it's also affordable 
when we look at cutting programs, when we look at changing things based on making sure we don't increase student tuition, mm -hmm. those are things that come to mind when we look at raising tuition. So I appreciate your um, bringing the issues up about minimum wage jobs, about these factors aren't always going up either. Mm -hmm. So then where is the stress? And then are we going to be losing students because of a $1 increase? That might not be too much for some, that might make a big difference for others in the amount of courses that they can take, the amount of credits that they can take. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, it's hard for me to know that a dollar, well, translated across all their credits, um, would necessarily be uh, the obstacle. But then I, I have to say I have students sometimes who come to class and say, um, I have to wait till I get paid to buy goggles for lab, which I always find kind of shocking, but I, I have that happen too. So I think um, it's hard to know exactly what situation some students are in. And, um, and so I, I don't think the $1 will be a barrier, but I think just in general as a philosophy of, of realizing that just because education costs more doesn't necessarily mean that our students will be able to shoulder more burden going forward because um, other factors like their income is not going up um, right. in the same way. So. And, and one part of the stool, the leg, did receive just a tax relief. So when we roll back the mill, so there's things that I appreciate you bringing these um, as we look forward to the December meeting. Uh, likewise, appreciate you bringing that up, and I also appreciate the trustees, um, the management committee giving the report, and uh, we have until December to listen and to contemplate and to think about a lot of things, uh, and so I appreciate you sharing your story. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Thanks, uh, Dr. Harvey. Appreciate it very much. Johnson County Research Triangle, Trustee Lynch. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I have a very brief report. October sales of tax revenue uh, was uh, $1,554,760.28, which is 1.82 percentage points over the same time in 2017. That trend is, uh, for the year to date, is 3.46% over on sales tax in Johnson County, which is very good news. Um, the uh, JCERT authority met on November 5th, uh, which is just about 10 days ago, and uh, at 7.30 at K-State Olathe. I unfortunately was not able to make that meeting, so I will report at our next meeting, once I get the minutes for that meeting, uh, the next meeting for JCERT is April 22nd, uh, 7.30 a.m. at KU Edwards campus, and mark your calendars. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, KACCT, Trustee Ingram. Yes, uh, the Kansas Association of Community College Trustees will meet on Sunday, December the 2nd, and Monday, December the 3rd at Independence Community College. We did not meet this month. Um, now, we did, several of us attended the American Association of Community College Trustee meeting in New York last month. So I don't know if you have some thoughts that you would like to share. You and I have sh shared very, very briefly. Um, yeah, um, so I brought back a lot of materials for the trustee library here, and I, everyone gets the trustee journal, so that is, it's a, or a quarterly. But the trustee library will have a lot of the packets that um, ACCT talks about, um, and then also some printed material from the um, presentations that I attended too. So those are gonna be in the trustee library for anybody. Uh, but a lot of it was about building blocks for student success and Dr. Sopcich was there as well. And uh, it was really interesting to see how uh, what was talked about is really helping the boards be able to use a lot, utilize the policy governance to align themselves with their initiatives. Uh, being able to see the role of the board, um, they gave examples of how some board uh, members were developing how to improve their efficiency of the board by creating board goals. Um, as a whole to be able to reflect what that uh, initiatives of their president. Um, so, and then building um, the skilled workforce through targeted career pathways. So that was really exciting to hear some of the things that Dr. Weber has been talking about with us. And then something that was really interesting in a movement that's happening in the country are um, student, elected student trustees 
on the student board. Some of them have non-voting rights, some of them have voting rights. So it's interesting to kind of see that dynamic shift um, as boards take on some uh, membership from their student senate. So it's really great. Yeah, I think we've talked very, very briefly. We have a meeting coming up, but we have uh, not had a chance to really exchange a lot of good ideas and information. We tried to attend different meetings, which I think is very appropriate in that situation. There were some themes to it, um, guided pathways, accessibility, promise, homelessness, some of the things that we've already talked about this evening. Um, one of the first questions that was asked in the first um, session that I attended was, what is standing in the way of their success, meaning student success? And they put some things on the board as far as um, from the time a student would apply to the community college and to the first day that they would show up for a class, all the different places that they would have had to have gone on, on a campus and all of the challenges in some situations that some of these students would face. And I was reminded of how one of the things that Dr. Larson did when she first came in was she went through that process and that really struck with me. So, you know, I think once again, um, you know, everyone always has room for improvement. There's no doubt about that. But um, we do a lot of things very, very well here at Johnson County Community College. And, uh, you know, I just appreciated the opportunity to, to attend. And we will continue to bring information, I'm sure, forward that we will reflect as being a part of that meeting. Thank you. Uh, foundation, Trustee Ingram. Uh, the foundation, the foundation has not met this month, but I do have a thank you that uh, they provided me with that I would like to go ahead and read. The foundation would like to thank the trustees for their attendance on Saturday evening at the 32nd Annual Sum and Janet Evening Scholarship Gala, which was held at the Overland Park Convention Center for the first time. The event was chaired by John and Christy Stewart with Mike Lally serving as a sponsorship chair. Doctors David and Mary Zamorowski were honored as the Johnson Countyans of the Year. The event raised a record of more than 800,000 to support scholarships at Johnson County Community College, and we had record attendance of nearly 800 attendees. The event also marked the launch of a 50th anniversary celebration of the college. Our 50,000 plus visionary sponsors this year were in Educate, Enrich, and Enable Fund, the Friends of Barton P. Cohen, Midwest Trust, FCI Advisors, the Bergman Family. Our 25,000 plus legacy sponsors this year were BNSF Railway, Claire Blair, Clay Blair Family Foundation, J.E. Dunn Construction Company, Kirk Foundation, McCowan Family Foundation Endowment, Mini Campen Scholarship Fund, <coughs> Olathe Health, the Rainier Family Foundations. We had two Sunflower sponsors at the $15,000 level, which included Black and & Veatch and Dick and & Barbara Scholl and three $10,000 open pedal sponsors, Barton P. and Mary D. Cohen Charitable Trust, Central Bank of the Midwest, and Adam and LaVon Hamilton. It was an honor for the foundation to have every trustee in attendance this year. We loved having staff and faculty there as well. We encourage you to mark your calendars for the 2019 gala on Saturday, November the 9th. This event will again be held at the Overland Park Convention Center and will conclude the college's 50th anniversary celebration. And that concludes my report. Thank you. I, I, I would likewise would like to thank all the trustees for being there and the Faculty Association having a table. It's just a terrific, terrific night. Uh, and then when you, when you think uh, you heard it all, you have a student get up and tell her story and, uh, and talks about her good friend. And, uh, and, and realizing that her good friend ended up being her mother, so they both were attending the college, and what a great story that was. So I don't think we had a dry eye at our table uh, when, when that occurred. So I want to thank the foundation and everybody, Nancy, for the great work. It was really a kind of a fun night, a great night. I think over 32 years now, we've given out, the foundation's given out over $10 million, if I remember those numbers correctly, for scholarships. And I think it was, uh, what, 1.2 million this year. So. Uh, the effort continues to grow. I know in visiting with uh, Mary Birch, uh, who was instrumental in the whole process, uh, I congratulated her for her work and getting 800,000, and she says, yeah, but we would have liked to have had a million. I mean, she's, she's working on that million number already, so. Mr. Chair, if I'm Yes, sir. In a, in a difficult political year, it, it, it's so nice to see people uh, in, in a post-mortem, regardless of whatever side we were on. And uh, I think the foundation in this college deserves a lot of credit 
for, I mean, much of what you just said. I don't mean to restate it, but I just wanted to reiterate that it's such a wonderful place to see people and come together after what was a difficult political yep. year. Well said. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, <coughs> Next item is the consent agenda. It's a time when we uh, deal with a number of routine items. Unless someone wants to pull an item from the agenda, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So move. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have no executive session this evening, so before we close, Trustee Snyder, any comments that you have about tonight's meeting? None tonight. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Lawson. Um, yes, uh, going on piggybacking what Trustee Cross just said, I think elections at times can really pull people apart, and especially um, the election night that we had, Johnson County Community College became part of history, um, and that I think transcends politics, period. So whichever side you were on, uh, it was just really exciting to see Johnson County Community College um, in the National Spotlight, in the Washington Times, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Casey Star. Um, and repeatedly, Johnson County Community College was referred to as um, the best uh, community college in America. So that was something that was uh, really great to tell our students the opportunities that start here. Thank you. Trustee Musil. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Lindstrom. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Trustee Cross. Yeah, I don't want to disrupt this apple cart. No. <laughs> Trustee Engram. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, I'm Thank glad you. I showed up, and uh, I, I'm just sick about missing that meeting. I, so Trustee Engram calls me and says, where are you? And I says, well, I'm, 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 I'm at home. And she said, well, we have a meeting, collegial steering, and it just flew right by me. Anyway, uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. A motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, we're adjourned.